CEO and CIO of ARK Invest. OpenAI is now the third largest position in the ARK Venture Fund. Kathy, it's great to have you on. Welcome. Thank you, Morgan. Happy to be here. Happy to see you. So I want to start right there because this was a record fundraising round. We know there was a lot attached to this fundraising round, including a promise of a conversion to a for-profit entity. Why did you feel it was compelling to invest now and at this valuation? Well, we've been doing work on AI for, for 10 years, and we've been waiting for the companies that were uh, r really that NVIDIA was going to hand the baton to. Not that NVIDIA's story is over at all, but as you know, NVIDIA is, has basically been community, communicating and investors have been buying a very big idea. And for uh, NVIDIA... Uh, to continue to work, we think there are going to be other winners. We think that the foundation model uh, players are going to be very big winners, uh, 15 to $20 trillion in uh, market cap in the next five to 10 years. Um, we put out a piece in our Sunday newsletter you can find on arc-invest.com, and we're going to put out a lot more on this. So OpenAI leading the charge, really, Anthropic, XAI, so uh, Elon Musk and team, and even Elon, I think, is saying those three, and, uh, and Google with Gemini are the big four. And, you know, unlike the railroad era, when many people are comparing this to the railroad era, uh, I think that the four winners are showing themselves very quickly, whereas in the railroad era, which, by the way, accounted for 63%, of the stock market in, in its heyday in the early 1900s, mm -hmm. uh, unlike the railroads, there were hundreds, I think there were hundreds, uh, we, can, we can focus on the big winners. This space is moving so quickly mm -hmm. and is going to become so big because it's effectively substituting software for labor. Not that this is... Not that this is going to kill jobs at all. It's going to make people much more productive. And they're already seeing it with uh, ChatGPT just as a starter. Mm. And, of course, the four companies you just mentioned are all companies that you are invested in through your funds. I mean, you mentioned XAI. It's been interesting because Elon Musk, co-founder of OpenAI, has been very vocal, very critical of where OpenAI is headed and the direction in which Sam Altman is taking it. Do you disagree? I think I think what he's talking about is more about the history of the company, and uh, and we're looking at the future. And uh, I was happy to hear that he did mention, of course, OpenAI as one of the leaders. Of course, it is. Uh, so you know, we're just looking to the future. I know there's a history there, and uh, you know what's done is done, and uh, we're just looking forward, trying to figure out. Who are going to be the big winners in this space? Uh, Kathy, want to look back at the innovation fund for a moment. Uh, over uh, some periods of time, uh, see the S&P is up 34 percent over a year, beating our ARK Innovation by 14 points, 94 percent over five years, beating that fund by 84 points, 191 percent over 10 years. That's for the S&P beating the innovation fund by 64 points pretty much since inception. What do you say to investors who look at that performance and, and doubt that you're making the right calls? Yes, uh, I would say, first of all, um, our compound annual rate of return since inception has been nearly 10 percent. Uh, we went through a boom uh, in 2020 during COVID, uh, where we were up 360 percent, and uh, and uh, we had valuation and interest rates and concentration in the markets working against us. Uh, we are a diversified exposure to innovation, truly disruptive innovation. I would focus uh, people on the fact and looking at your chart there that if you take away that boom and bust, uh, what we have now is three forces working for us and a long base. Uh, again, you take away, you can say we have a base after that period. You can look uh, at, since 2018, we've been basing. And I remember saying this with Tesla at the time, the longer the base, 
the bigger the breakout. And, and we certainly were right there. Um, the three forces that I think are going to become tailwinds now, they have been headwinds. Uh, interest rates, uh, they're coming down. And I think they're going, despite what we saw in the employment report today, I do think that they will come down uh, more than people think during, during the months ahead. Uh, the sure. second is the concentration in the market towards the MAG-6, that is starting to dissipate. Uh, and I think that will work in our favor. And then the third is valuation. During August, when the market got hit, uh, our valuation, as measured by enterprise value to EBITDA, uh, dropped to nearly a market multiple. We were basically sitting on a market multiple at 21 times EBITDA, uh, enterprise value at, uh, relative to EBITDA. Now, we do adjust it for stock-based compensation, which is really important when it comes to innovation, alignment with shareholders, as well as normalize R&D. Uh, but that valuation typically is twice the markets, uh, and we hit the market. So now I'm looking at what were headwinds turning around and becoming tailwinds. People that you talk to, um, there's a tremendous amount of bullish options activity around NVIDIA going out into the spring yeah. of 2025. Give me some more specifics on that, and then we can kick this around the table. But I, I find this interesting, and I think all of you will, too. So I'm a cash equities guy. I'm not in the options market, but a lot of people I talk to are. I was talking to my friend Joe Fami, who's on the network uh, a lot. And Joe is looking at something that you really don't see very often. Here you have the second largest market cap company uh, in the world basically trading at an all-time record high, and you see monster, monster call buying at the March uh, strikes from like 150 all the way up to 189. We're talking about thousands and thousands of contracts. This is not retail money. This is obviously somebody very sophisticated or somebody very insane, but they are betting big on continued record highs out into earnings season for this name. And it's worth bringing up because it's so far out, both out of the money and, and that March strike is so far away from now. Uh, it just, I think it becomes emblematic of what this stock has been able to do, despite uh, lackluster performance from the other gigantic tech mega caps. It really is its own world right now. And it's just so tough to bet against this thing. Every time you think it's over, it's like it's just getting warmed up. You know, Kev, we when we when we talk about, you know, Josh talks about March of 25. You're like, well, what's interesting about March of 25? And then we are also reminded that of all of the mega cap tech stocks, NVIDIA is the latest reporter of the group. Right. I mean, you go through the banks and then you get some, you know, big S&P names and then you start to get the mega caps. But then you got to wait like almost a month after that all of the mega caps start reporting until NVIDIA reports. So maybe that has something to do with it, too. But you've noticed this volume of pickup as well. Yeah, I think what's interesting to the viewers is to appreciate what this trade is and not looking at it from the thousands of shares in the institutional side, but just breaking it down on one share. So let's pretend that NVIDIA is around 130 bucks a share, give or take. This 150 option needs to go up $20 for it to break even, and they're paying 13 14 So that means you need to see NVIDIA at 163 to 164 just to break even on this trade. Now, that doesn't mean that the stock can't move, and we know all about the Greeks and the Deltas, and you can trade it tomorrow. But just to put it into perspective, what we're talking about, that is a very bullish thesis on NVIDIA in a relatively...